Good evening, everybody. I want to thank you for logging in for tonight's webinar on the metabolic triads. Uh, just as a reminder, this is a preview of Module 20A in the metabolic triads. And Module 20A is going to take place on April 11th through 13th at the Gaylord Palms Resort in Orlando, Florida. So this is coming up really soon. Uh, we're, uh, our presenter tonight is Dr. Gary Huber. Uh, Dr. Huber is the president of the Laval Metabolic Institute. He spent 20 years as an emergency medicine physician before joining Jim Laval in the practice of integrative medicine at LMI. Dr. Huber is an adjunct professor teaching integrative medicine practice at the University of Cincinnati College of Pharmacy, as well as a clinical preceptor for pharmacy students. Dr. Huber has authored articles on metabolic syndrome and its relation to cardiovascular health. He has developed the Metabolic Code Professional Weight Loss Program, which has proven to be a great adjunct in treating metabolic syndrome patients. He has lectured on this as well as bioidentical hormone strategies at A4M conferences and acts as a preceptor for A4M fellows. Uh, I want to Thank Dr. Huber for uh, doing this presentation tonight with us. And Dr. Huber, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. And thanks, everybody, for being here this evening. I know it takes a lot of intestinal fortitude to come home from a long day and decide to tune into a webinar. So we'll try to make this interesting. I think we have some good information here. Um, as Daniel pointed out, the uh, conference coming up is in Orlando, Florida. That's uh, 20A and that's the triad system. And that's really what I want to go over this evening is just kind of what the triads are and by way of demonstration we'll take a case and uh, we'll go through that and show how the triads are used. I'm sure on this call there are some out there that have uh, been doing integrative care, going to conferences, and one of the struggles that I often hear and certainly the struggle that I first encountered was how do you organize your information? When you start seeing patients we know we were taught medical school and the systems approach, but how does that translate as we get into integrative care? It's a little different picture. So the purpose of the triads is to really just help us organize our information, stay focused on the key issues to allow us to keep our treatment programs concise and effective and not get moved into a direction that's kind of uh, off the most important issue. Uh, our patient here tonight is Paul. and. Uh, I knew Paul before he became a patient of mine. We used to work out together, and Paul's a 45-year-old guy who is very fit. When you see him, you look at him and say, wow, that guy's really in shape. Uh, but he comes to me kind of as a surprise. He pulled me aside one day and said he could hardly keep up his workouts. He could hardly do uh, his daily routine. He was very fatigued, had a lot of body ache. And the thing he kept reiterating was he goes, I just feel very old. I feel way older than I am. He had no energy in the morning. It took him at least an hour to kind of get up and get rolling. Then he would have a drop in energy in, at 2 in the afternoon. So you know he felt like his day was very short, not getting much done. Uh, at night, he would surge with energy, as we often see with adrenal fatigue type patients. And then he'd have trouble falling asleep, and sometimes the sleep would be interrupted uh, multiple times through the night. So we've all heard these kinds of stories. Um, he states he feels much older than his years which is really frustrating. He holds martial art belts in three different forms of martial arts. So this is a very high output, very accomplished, both physically and mentally uh, kind of guy. He is a software programmer. So he's under a lot of stress with his job. Uh, consumes one night of, or one glass of wine per night uh, and has never smoked. He, like I say, looks very fit, but he confides, you know, he's gained five pounds in the last year. They're starting to bother him. He can't quite get it to come off. Uh, the rest of his history, he has a history of sleep apnea, which goes counter to what we would intuit, right? There's a lean, relatively lean guy in shape, uh, not obese, but he has sleep apnea, but he can't tolerate the CPAP, so he still struggles with that. He gets headaches off and on. They weren't real severe. Uh, history of hypertension, lipids, and mitral valve prolapse, for which he's on some medications, some lisinopril, hydrochlorothiazide and Lipitor. And again, it's kind of deceiving that this guy would have high blood pressure given all his athletic pursuits. His gut, he reports constipation, diarrhea, and diverticuli. He said he had reflux really badly as a child. Uh, now as an, in adulthood, it's intermittent. He gets it from time to time, but it's not real uh, 
severe for him at this point. So you look at all this, and there's a lot going on. It's certainly multi-system, uh, many symptoms. He's on a few medications, not a lot to manage there. So that's always the question, where do you start? Well, that's what the triad system is designed to help. Um, I use it with my patients. I actually pull out a sheet, and we do have uh, a sheet that we use just to help organize your thoughts. And I'll go through it with the patients sometimes and demonstrate for them where they are in their metabolism and where do we want to go. One of the triads is the gut immune brain. And this is one that we all see quite commonly in our office every day. Uh, bowel issues that arise, and we're familiar with that. The immune system, 70% of it exists in the lining of the intestine in the form of payers patches. So there's always going to be a direct link between gut issues and immune issues. You know, if somebody comes in and says they have asthma, that's a gut immune issue. Um, asthma is quite commonly a food allergy. Food allergies affecting the immune system, housed in the gut. So we've seen that quite a bit. We know that the brain has more microglial cells or immune cells than it has nerves. So the brain is a very active immune tissue and it's quite common and you know, almost sine qua non that when I see somebody that comes in with bowel problems of a chronic nature, they inevitably have brain issues related to sleep or mood or other issues, uh, memory, cognition, etc. So this is just an example of one of the triads and in Paul's case we have under the gut we have reflux, constipation and diarrhea, diverticuli. Under the brain certainly he reports having some headaches and sleep issues and then under immune we have to guess that he might have some food allergies given that he had reflux as a young child. Uh, they've gotten better but when you have reflux at that age often food allergies are an issue. If we looked at all the triads, there's five triads, and they're meant to you know, kind of uh, show the relationships that we commonly see. You would not even think about looking at the adrenal gland without also considering the thyroid because they, they are related and they coexist, as well as the pancreas. So we know the legendary relationships between adrenal function, its ability to downregulate thyroid, and increase insulin production from the pancreas. So that's a natural uh, combination of organs that you would think of in combination. Um, triad 2, gut immune brain we just talked about. Triad 3 is the cardiopulmonary, vascular, and neurologic system. And neurologic in this expression refers more to the sympathetic, parasympathetic tone as it relates to cardiovascular uh, issues, hypertension, arrhythmias, and so forth. The uh, fourth triad is kind of the detox triad. It's liver, lymph, and kidney. And uh, obviously, detoxification through all three of those organs becomes significant. And triad five, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. So getting back to Paul's case, I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of information up front, and then we're going to go back and kind of rework his case, or at least I'll show you how I worked his case. Um, we had his complaints and he certainly we had concerns about his adrenal picture, his energy was low, that was his primary issue. A lot of his symptoms made testosterone an immediate concern. Um, and we can, you know, we talked uh, at the, the Triad Conference uh, 28, we do quite a bit of discussion on hormone and hormone replacement therapies and their impact. And one of the points that I always make is when we think testosterone, don't make the mistake of thinking of your 65 year old patient. Uh, the vast majority of low testosterone patients that I treat are in their 40s and 50s. Certainly there's some in 60s and 70s. Um, but I was just talking with Daniel uh, before we started the webinar. I have two gentlemen in my practice now. One is only 21 years old with low testosterone. So this runs the gambit and it needs to be something you're looking at earlier on. Don't wait for your patients to get 50 plus years to start looking at this. Here's a healthy fit guy who's a martial arts dude, and he looks like a dude, and his testosterone is 214. So Paul's lab showed high cortisol, 20.7. His thyroid is suboptimal. He didn't have antibodies, thank goodness, but his free T3 is on the low end of normal, and his T4 is less than the 50th percentile, so suboptimal, to say the least. Uh, we begin to think about how cortisol is probably the cause of that. The C-reactive protein is 12.8, very high. 
certainly this combination already, without even going beyond this point, begins to explain some of his cardiovascular problems that he currently has and certainly lends you toward thinking that this guy is at risk for an MI if we don't change his course. So C-reactive protein very high. Uh, the glucose 136 and I was surprised by his insulin. Insulin was 61. Uh, this is a two-hour postprandial. Uh, we typically, I just use a bagel and jelly. Uh, we have some other non-gluten containing options but they ingest 75 grams of glucose, which is the standard, and then have their blood checked two hours later. The uh, creatinine was elevated, 1.36, and this was not done at the initial intake, but we later discovered that he did have food allergies. It was uh, a suspicion based on the history we saw, and we followed up on it later and found that he had true IgE egg allergy, but he also had IgG sensitivities, uh, several of them, and of course, wheat, gluten, yeast, uh, and dairy, those are the most common foods that we eat and those are the most common allergens that we see. So this was the lab that he had. Um, we kind of lay it out like this. We know that testosterone is one of the bigger issues and um, this is a, a case that I use to demonstrate testosterone treatment. So we've laid out triad number five here, the testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, and we can see the testosterone is low at 214. His estrogens were kind of high normal, estradiol not too bad at 37, but his strone a little bit elevated at 59. And all the symptoms in the center of that triangle reflect the symptoms that relate to that hormone issue. Okay, so his sleep and body ache, fatigue, the insulin issue, cognition, and just feeling old. All of those can be accounted for by low testosterone. But then the rest of the triads, we begin to lay out the rest of the symptoms or issues or complaints that he had. And the one that, at least in my view, as I look at this, triad one really jumps out. He had significant insulin resistance. Uh, his cortisol was 21. He had low thyroid function. Um, he comes to us saying, I'm tired. I'm fatigued. I feel old. So certainly this gets heightened in terms of we want to address his primary complaint. Triad two, yeah, he's got some GI issue. And that's causing some headache and some, uh, some sleep disturbance. And yes, he has some food allergy. But just as a way of prioritizing what's more significant, hopefully you kind of see that this is really weighted toward triad one. Hypertension and lipids, yes, he has those things. But realistically, how are we going to treat them? You know, the real risk with hypertension and hyperlipidemia is if we don't get to the underlying cause. And the underlying cause is probably wrapped up and his cortisol is in some resistance in his testosterone. So yes, it's important, but I'm not going to call that a priority at this time. And then the, uh, uh, not the creatine, that should be uh, creatinine. His creatinine was elevated and certainly a concern, but I think with the other issues we address, that will resolve, especially if we increase cardiac output with testosterone. So his treatment you know, triad one, that's what he comes in us complaining about is how tired he is. And we know he has that high cortisol. So always, and this is just a general rule of thumb that's probably drilled into all of our heads, but just to repeat, always treat adrenal before you address the thyroid. Otherwise, you make, you make somebody wired and tired, and nobody likes that. Nobody feels good when they get thyroid treatment without addressing the adrenal. So that really jumps out as something primary we're going to have to address. But really, if I look at triad five and the low testosterone, it directly affects all of the other triads. It's going to impact insulin resistance. There's a strong correlation between your testosterone and your risk for diabetes. So that interplay is, is ironclad. Um, the impact that testosterone has at reducing hypertension and lipids, energy, sleep. People with low testosterone typically sleep very poorly muscle weight. He feels old. This is a guy who's an athlete. He's used to sore muscles. He's used to exercising or training and having some muscle ache and revels in that, enjoys that. This is beyond that. This is muscle ache that makes him feel like an old man. And then the renal perfusion, which we see is low with the creatinine being elevated. Testosterone directly impacts cardiac output and will increase renal perfusion, which is probably his biggest issue with regards to his kidney. So with that, you know, he's only 45 years old. We're probably going to lean toward clomiphene twice a week as treatment, something that will centrally stimulate 
his hypothalamus to make more luteinizing hormone. At age 45, <clears throat> far and away, the most consistent cause of low testosterone is not primary hypogonadism. It is secondary hypogonadism coming from a dysfunctional hypothalamic pituitary axis. So that's why the clomiphen in this case we're doing a great service trying to reinstill his own testosterone rather than us trying to manhandle it, giving him topical or other testosterone modes. And then triad uh, two, he does have some multiple gut issues that are affecting his brain in terms of sleep and headache. And we'll start him on a probiotic most likely and look to address his allergies with sublingual immune therapy. And that's a way to reverse his uh, allergies. One thing that we definitely stress at uh, LMI is looking for drug-induced nutrient depletions. Uh, Jim Laval wrote the book on, on drug-induced nutrient depletion. So understanding that the medications he's been taking can and probably are to some degree compromising his health and creating some of his symptoms. If we look at his lisinopril depletes zinc. What do we need zinc for? Well, we need zinc to make proper testosterone. The prostate is the highest concentrated tissue in the body with zinc. Zinc has an impact on aromatase, and so when zinc is low, we oftentimes see testosterone turning into uh, estrogen, and we see that a little bit in Paul with his estrone starting to uh, elevate. Hydrochlorothiazide also depletes zinc, but more importantly, CoQ10, magnesium, some of the other electrolytes, and then Lipitor depletes CoQ10, and then the fat-soluble vitamin D and D, as well as omega-3, carnitine, and selenium. So this becomes important when you're looking at a patient and we start to wonder, okay, well, how many supplements is this patient going to tolerate? Um, it helps you at least put this in your decision making. And in Paul's case, I felt that the CoQ10 was grossly significant, especially as CoQ10 will reduce blood pressure, certainly important for energy, which he's complaining is poor, mitochondrial ATP production, uh, cardiovascular function in general. So. He has two drugs that are depleting his CoQ10. That's going to be very important to replace. Zinc's going to be very important, uh, probably some fish oil, magnesium. So backing up, we're going to pretend we don't know what his lab showed. This was when I initially saw him. I did not have any lab results, and I sent him out the door with some things to get him on the right track. Obviously, being fatigued, I used adrenal cortex. Uh, I would not use a whole gland on somebody like this if they're hypertensive. Uh, even if they're well-controlled with medication, I don't want to exacerbate their blood pressure with a whole gland. So I just use adrenal cortex. That avoids the epinephrine, norepinephrine potential. Um, one to two tablets twice a day. Uh, I use the philodendron magnolia uh, extracts that uh, most of you are, are familiar with. And that's a nice adaptogen three times a day. Um, Got to get that cortisol to come down. We did some studies at LMI some years ago using this product and it had a dramatic impact on reinstilling a proper cortisol DHEA level. In other words, it promoted DHEA and it regulated cortisol down, uh, which was beneficial. So start him on that, see if that doesn't help regulate cortisol in the daytime, hopefully translating into better rest at nighttime. His gut immune brain, uh, put him on a probiotic and some cat's claw just to begin that bowel detoxification process as he had had some problems. Not this primary driver, but certainly we know the gut's impact on, on brain and the, the basic need for probiotic uh, for detoxification and uh, many other functions. Melatonin I used uh, just to help him sleep. He had a history of some bowel issue. Melatonin is kind of a, uh, a nice adjunct as most of the receptors for melatonin are in the gut. It can work really well in IBS type patients. I wouldn't classify Paul is a true IBS, but with his complaints of his uh, GERD in the past and uh, his, his food allergens, uh, melatonin should help his sleep pattern and uh, lend some support to bowel function. And then lastly, the drug-induced nutrient depletions. I felt CoQ10 was essential, so I started him on that. I also used a multivitamin that had zinc and magnesium and used some omega-3. Uh, omega-3 omega fats, when given with probiotics, help the adherence of the probiotic to the bowel wall. In fact, it will increase adherence about 70%. So like those for anti-inflammatory, I like that for his brain function, I like that for his bowel. So try to overlap benefits as much as we can. The follow-up 
uh, with the lab results. Now we have the labs that we're aware of, and certainly at this point, in my mind, testosterone jumps to the top of the list, meaning, yes, we know he has adrenal and thyroid issue. But again, testosterone is going to impact all the other triads. We know that blood sugar, it's nearly impossible to get blood sugar to behave if testosterone is low. Uh, if you took a room full of diabetics, half of them will have low testosterone. And if you took a room full of men with low testosterone, nearly all of them, greater than 90%, will have low blood sugar. So there's a strong correlation. Testosterone has a direct impact on the oxidative phosphorylation genes and uh, thereby the mechanism by which the, the cell can even take up glucose. So that's going to be important. Certainly it's going to affect his energy levels, which is what he primary, uh, primarily came to us. We know about the cardiovascular benefits. So I moved this as my primary focus. Now here's where the triads really help because he's got all this going on. You can get pulled in many different directions, but if you address what you really feel is the primary physiologic mechanism, then everything else starts to fall in the line. I very rarely put hormones as the primary triad, but in Paul's case, it seemed appropriate given his history and given the, the physicality of who he was. Um, hormones, I often say, are you know the sprinkles that go on at the end, but um, in this case, I think it jumps to the front. So we did use clomiphene. We also used zinc, magnesium, and a high-protein diet, which all of these have been shown to increase testosterone levels. The adrenal thyroid pancreas, we gave him, as we talked about, the cortex, the philodendron magnolia. I added a thyroid gland. He didn't have antibodies, so this was open to use. And I used alpha-lipoic acid to help with blood sugar. Alpha-lipoic acid is also kidney protective, so I was hoping it would lend an impact on that uh, creatinine. Uh, it's a good antioxidant and has good cardiovascular and mitochondrial effects. So again, it, it hits many buttons, so to speak. The magnesium, vitamin D, chromium, these also hit many areas for him. So chromium does help T4 to T3 conversion. It also helps blood sugar, obviously. Um, vitamin D, we know the, the broad range of impact that can have. Triad 2, the gut immune brain, um, kept him on the probiotic. The melatonin we had started on seemed to cause him agitation. So we just discontinued that. I counted on the change or the reduction in inflammation from the omega-3 and from the increased testosterone that that would help his sleep patterns, and it ended up doing so. Uh, triad 3, cardiovascular, neuro, uh, put him on some H, garlic, omega-3, and vitamin D. So, so we've kind of separated out, separated out his problems, and uh, this is how he progressed. You know, we continued to work his lifestyle, uh, educated him about diet and proper fluid intake. He was already a very good exerciser. And as he improved, he reduced his supplements. Uh, holy basil was later added to help with sleep. The sleep did get somewhat better. Holy basil was a nice adjunct. Um, talked to him about getting a dental appliance to help with his sleep apnea. Uh, sleep's never going to be great if he doesn't get that taken care of. And then niacin was added to treat his lipids, which were later found to be uh, slightly off. I think his LDL was a little bit elevated. And uh, sublingual immune therapy was started to treat his food allergies. So now we're really going to the heart of inflammation and treating the bowel. And hopefully that's going to reduce C-reactive protein. So as we look at his labs, uh, this is eight months after starting with Paul. His testosterone, which uh, started at 214, has now jumped up to 747. And this is just 50 milligrams of clomiphene twice a day. Binding globulin. So we calculate his bioavailable fraction, which I think was around 52 or something, and now it's up to 149. So well within a good, healthy range. And uh, Paul's an interesting guy. He's, he's British. And so if you've ever spoken with someone from Britain, the word brilliant gets used quite a bit. You know, if you do something good, that was brilliant. And he would come into my office saying, you know, how do you feel, Paul? I feel brilliant. I just feel brilliant. So he was really, uh, really becoming, snapping around uh, quite quickly. With every visit, he was just another level better. Uh, cortisol started up very high, almost 21, down to 14.9. Glucose really came into uh, place very quickly once the testosterone normalized. The CRP, which was horrible, is now less than one. Uh, the thyroid function, nicely up. T3 is in that mid position, so not quite so low. And the allergies, uh, were treated with the sublingual immune therapy. His bowel function improved. He had absolutely no more reflux or discomfort. 
Um, after treating him for, I think it was a year, maybe 14 months, 15 months, we discontinued the uh, clomiphene and waited three months, retested him, and his testosterone stayed elevated. So he was now, we had basically kind of rejuvenated his hypothalamic function, and he was maintaining it on his own. And we will continue to monitor him, but he does not need to stay on clomiphene at this point. Um, hypertension was still an issue, could not get that to come down. We talked about doing a dental appliance. I sent him off to a biologic dentist that uh, will look at his airway. I think there are a lot of people that have sleep apnea, such as Paul, and they ignore it and they say, I'm fine, but it's often at the cause of high cortisol and often at the cause of an increased sympathetic tone that drives pressure. So hopefully we'll continue to work on Paul and get that resolved. So the benefits overall of the triad system, hopefully this case was instrumental. I, I hope that it was. It helps me compartmentalize the issues. It helps me prioritize what my treatments are going to be. Uh, it can be very easy with a guy like Paul to say, oh, he has reflux or, oh, he has hypertension. We need to use arginine. We need to do and get carried on a track that is maybe not his primary issue. And you want these patients to get better. So you're, you're going to accomplish that more quickly, staying on a pointed course of therapy and not getting too scattered. Um, in our conference, we talk about real products and we talk about real dosing. And I think that's helpful. I keep getting feedback from docs that this really helps because so many of times we read stuff and it just says, well, ALA is great or some other supplement is really good, you know, but in what application, at what dose, who's the real manufacturer we're using, and we give those pieces of information. Um, we've got proven results. We've got uh, up in Virginia, uh, Dr. Andy Heyman, and many of you have heard him speak, and you know uh, what amazing work he does. Uh, Jim Laval needs no uh, discussion. Everybody knows Jim pretty well, I would imagine, and uh, certainly the clinic that I operate in Cincinnati. We get consistently good results. So we share that with you, our pearls from our experience, and we review a lot of case studies. There's a case study after every section so that you get a chance to really put these things to work. So it just kind of helps offer an organized approach to complex cases. Um, this is, again, the conference 20A, April 11 through 13 in Orlando, and uh, I hope to see you guys there. I'll be there talking about hormones and uh, doing cases and, um, oops, that's my contact information, so if you need that, but that is the conference, so get signed up, and I look forward to seeing you there. All right. Great. Well, I am done with that case, and uh, Daniel, I'll let you take it over from here. Yeah, well, it looks like we've got a couple excellent questions from some people who, who have questions about your case here. So uh, the first question is from Carlos. Actually, Carlos has two questions. So, Carlos, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you now. So, please turn down your speakers and get ready to ask your question. Carlos, are you available? Uh, yes, I am. Hi, Carlos. Go go ahead. Hi, Carlos. Oh, I was just hi. Uh, I'm just wondering why uh, the cortisol uh, in blood and not in saliva. Well, uh, the other question. It, well, okay. Um, it's a cost issue. I love salivary cortisols, but they're not free. Um, most of my patients can get their labs done through their insurance, and that saves them money. Um, on many cases, um, clinically, I have found that in dealing with patients, pretty much through their history, I get a pretty good idea of where they're at, you know, if they have adrenal fatigue. And what I'm really looking for with a blood cortisol is are they just a little bit off, or are they flat down to the bottom or are they truly elevated like Paul was and above 20. So this is not going to be as accurate as a four-point salivary cortisol, but it gets me started and it saves the patients money. And I would say in more than 90% of my patients, I never end up resorting to a four-point cortisol because if I'm moving them forward and they're getting better just based on their clinical history, that I, I don't that often need it. Okay, and the second question is, was Paul uh, tested for TPO, thyroid antibodies? I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the question. What about TPO? Yes, uh, was Paul tested for TPO? Oh, yeah, yeah. He was checked for antithyroid globulin antibodies as well as TPO, and both were negative. Okay. All right. 
And uh, which brings up a good point because if if they had been positive, I could not have used thyroid gland. I would have had to found other alternatives to uh, treat them either with uh, selenium and iodine um, or just relying on the uh, the lowering of the cortisol to kind of take the brakes off the thyroid. Great. Well, thank you, Carlos. Uh, our next question is from Nicole. Nicole, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you now. So uh, turn down your speakers and get ready to ask your question. Uh, Nicole, Hi. are you? Hi, Nicole. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Great. Hi, Nicole. Hey, Dr. Huber. How are you? Good. Um, thanks. Good, good. I have a very quick question about at what point do you start t uh, treating low testosterone? Um, would a level of like 550 or 560 in a male that has um, just been diagnosed with um, fairly significant sleep apnea as well as some insulin resistance? Well, that's a great question. I look at bioavailability. So with a, a level of 550, Without knowing the sex hormone binding globulin, I have no idea how effective that testosterone level is. Um, actually, sex hormone binding globulin was not super elevated. It was close. It was, I think, 49. And then the bioavailable was on the low side. Okay, so let me get out my notebook. I can't find, so my, I use... I can't find the labs. So when we talk about insulin resistance, we know that testosterone plays a big role there. Right. But it's certainly not the only guy in town, and if his numbers are normal, it's not necessarily going to drive a better in effect on calculating his uh, bioavailable fraction. Now. And I'm coming up with about 110. So he's got adequate testosterone. Now I, I would look at that and say it's not the testosterone that's driving his issues. You know, if he's got sleep issues or insulin resistance issues, we need to look elsewhere. Right. Um, because if the bioavailable fraction is adequate, we're in good shape, and he seems okay. to be at this point. Okay. Yeah. And and that's something else we talk about at the conference. You know, how do we determine if uh, if testosterone is adequate? I've got I got a guy that his, his testosterone is only 400. You know, but his binding globulin is so low that his bioavailable fraction is in a good that's position. High. Yeah, yeah and I don't look at free testosterone. That's a that's a very poor measure of what his testosterone function truly is. So we don't want to look at the free. That's only two percent of the testosterone in his body, and that test is done with a very cheap assay. Mm -hmm. That is that is unreliable. So I always just look at the binding globin and then calculate the free frac or the bioavailable fraction. All right, I will. Uh, I'll go back and redo that. The other thing too is his HbA1c was elevated at five point seven. So. Okay. Um, I've taken them off as many carbohydrates as possible, higher protein, better digestion, and uh -huh. the CPAP, I think, is going to make a huge difference. I agree. I, I'm part of a sleep council here in town of integrative, uh, integrative and sleep docs and biologic dentists, and we all get together and talk about these things. I think it's one of the things that's underdiagnosed. Um, that we don't have, do you use the uh, Epworth questionnaire to, to evaluate patients' risk? Uh, I don't. Um, there's uh, one of the physicians in town. I live in Seattle. One of the physicians in town. Actually, the the sleep studies have become so simple now. They give you a um, they give you a device that you can bring home. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so you have somebody in your area that can do that. Yeah, and it's always it's always difficult when you have somebody who's tall and thin. Uh huh. And doesn't fit the the typical profile of being very overweight and a lot of weight around their neck and whatnot. Yeah. Um, have you ever seen anybody grow out of it, and I put grow out of it in quotes, after they've been on a CPAP machine for a while? I can't say that I've seen I mean, you're talking about a thin, lean person? Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know that I've seen them grow out of it. I think you can treat them to some degree out of it, meaning okay. if you identify the inflammatory factors that are causing that airway, if it's truly anatomical and they just have a big tongue and a, and a narrow airway, um, there, there may be nothing you can do. I use a lot of uh, dental appliances over the CPAP because patients tolerate it better. Anybody can clip a little piece of plastic onto their teeth. They tolerate that better than they do the mask. But now if somebody has you know, food allergens or they have other inflammatory habits and you change that, you begin to open up that airway a bit. You can open it up to the point that either they don't need or their pressure can go down on the CPAP. I've seen that certainly happen. Mm -hmm. Where the amount of pressure that they need on the CPAP has been reduced because we got rid of the airway. Uh, well, we've so actually started him on the absolute lowest pressure at four, and already his his snoring is completely resolved. 
Good. So um, there's a, the, a very strong family history, his father, his mother, and both his brothers. Um, oh, not his mother, okay. but um, had issues with snoring, and both of his brothers who are still living had CPAPs. Okay. So I think it's anatomical. Yeah, really very does. well could be. That's great, though, that you have easy access for sleep studies and you follow oh, that. Oh, it was so simple because so many patients that I've referred when I used to live in Chicago were, they didn't want to go because they would get a horrible night's sleep and they felt that that um, was really um, not an accurate uh, thing for them. And then the other question that I had very quickly was, um, this patient was at his cardiologist's and he had been on time-release niacin and the cardiologist said that there was a... Um, a report in JAMA that said that niacin does not work for lowering triglycerides. That feud will be re-examined re, uh, at the 20A conference by Dr. Mark Houston. And okay. He'll, he'll detail for you. I don't want to steal his thunder. He'll detail for you why the particular study that made the news is flawed, that okay. there are, is ample evidence that it does work. Um, <laughs> one thing I'll tell you, which we all should know, is that niacinamide is not niacin, and right. niacinamide has no impact. But right. niacin definitely works for triglycerides, and, and uh, like I said, Mark will, will go He said that. all it does is it raises, what they've proven is that it raises HDL, but does nothing to lower triglycerides. And I have seen it time and time and time again, and I wasn't in a position to get into an argument with him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you want to go back and, uh, let me see here, I'm just trying to see if I can pull this up real quick. I had... Um, Do you have the journal article? Yeah, yeah. Because I haven't been able to find it. Okay, well, let me see here. I know Mark had sent it to me, and he sent a little discussion about it, and I haven't had the opportunity to read it in its entirety. I read the uh, abstract um, somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. Here we go. I think this might be it. Let me look. Here it is. Um... Yeah, 2012, the article is by Fan, P-H-A-N is the last name. Second name on the list is Munoz, M-U-N-O-Z. And it was in um, trying to find the journal. It's the effects of niacin on glucose levels, coronary stenosis progression, in clinical events and subjects with normal baseline glucose levels. Hmm. And it was, hmm, it says ACON, well, American Journal of Cardiology Online is apparently how he came across it. And I don't see the citing other than it's the uh, Journal of the American College of Cardiology. And it was 2012? Here it is. Oh. American Journal. Journal Cardiology 2013, my mistake. Um, it was 111, semicolon 352 to 355. Great. Thank you for that very much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. Thanks. Have a good evening. You too. You know, it looks like Carlos has a follow up question. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute follow, uh, Carlos real quick. He's got a question about, uh, about Paul. Carlos. You are unmuted. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I'd like to know if uh, Paul is still being treated with uh, lisinopril, hydrochlorothiazide, and Lipitor nowadays. I've taken him off the hydrochlorothiazide. His blood pressure did improve, but I can't get him yet off the lisinopril, and that's what I had mentioned. I think his sleep apnea is probably our hurdle at this point, so I have him set up to see a dentist to look at getting a bite plate since he didn't tolerate the uh, CPAP. I want to see if he can tolerate a dental appliance and if that won't lower his blood pressure. Um, the Lipitor, uh, he came off. Yeah, he is off Lipitor at this point, just being maintained with garlic, and um, but he still has lisinopril. Okay, thank you. All right, you're welcome. Great. Thank you, Carlos. Well, that looks, we have one more question, but I'm going to go ahead and answer that right now myself. Uh, Darren was asking if this module is being, or excuse me, this uh, webinar is being recorded. Yes, it is being recorded. I'm going to do my best tomorrow to get it edited and posted online and sent out to every single person who 
uh, registered and RSVP'd and logged in. So it will be on YouTube. We'll be sending it out via email. So you should see it either tomorrow or first thing Monday. Uh, so um, looks like that's all we have for questions. So uh, Dr. Huber, I really appreciate you doing this with us tonight. And I, I think you gave a great explanation of what the triads are, how they can help patients and how it can be integrated into your practice. This has been wonderful. I enjoyed myself. Thanks. Uh, thanks to everybody for, uh, for turning on this evening. And thanks, Daniel, for taking care of all the electronics. Absolutely. My pleasure. And just as a reminder, this is a preview of uh, Module 20A in Orlando on April 11th through 13th at the Gaylord Palms Resort. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to uh, go to our website at a4m.com. Give us a call at 561-997-0112, or you can email us at info at a4m.com, and we'll get that uh, passed on to an educational coordinator right away. So again, Dr. Huber, thank you so much for doing this with us. We appreciate it, and we'll see you in Orlando. Thank you, everyone. See you there. Bye-bye. Take care.